so you are uh, an open uh, late teen, and you have conservative parents, and you say, Mom, Dad, um, I think I've decided that I'm going to be an artist. Oh, yeah, and they think, um, what's wrong with that kid? That's a, that's a complicated uh, conversation, isn't it? Yes, yes. It's, 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 it's like discussing color with someone who's colorblind. And, and I mean that. I, and it's, it's actually a perverse, things about, perverse thing about conservatives in some sense, because the, the data on the economic utility of artists is really, really strong. I mean, artists, artists and entrepreneurs are the same people. And of course, entrepreneurs are the people who provide all of the vision for the entire capitalist system. They're absolutely necessary. But conservatives tend to be so blind to art that they can't even see that the artists are the people who drive the, who drive the economy forward. What's wrong with our social structure? Well, well, first of all, are creative people common? Uh, are there a lot of them? Is this a problem we need to solve to find a way to integrate them and to, ex well, no, I don't want to say exploit them, mm -hmm. but exploit their creativity mm -hmm. for the greater good? Oh. Uh, we don't seem to be very good at that. We, we've marginalized them. There's no minimum wage for visual artists, for example. Mm -hmm. No, we do can have a we, job Can we it. fix this, our communities? Well, the, the, our the correlation between grades and creativity in university, at the University of Toronto, for example, is zero, right? But that's because it's not that easy to grade people who are creative. But like, so educational institutions do an, a great job, especially at, at before the university level, of just crushing creative people. So because the education system was actually set up back in the late 1900s to train the children of workers to be obedient workers. I mean, you think, think all the desks are lined up in a row. You're supposed to sit down. You're supposed to shut up. You're supposed to do what you're told. You do things by the bell. That's a factory bell that rings for recess and so forth. They're factories. You don't produce creative people in factories. You produce factory workers, and that's fine, except there aren't any factory workers anymore, so we should um, probably stop doing it. I'm not sure so things have changed. They haven't changed at all. Things haven't changed very much. No, no. The reason Jungian psychology works is because it works for creative people. It doesn't work at all for non-creative people. It just falls dead and flat for them. They're, they're not interested in it at all. It isn't how they think. You mean as therapy? Yeah, oh. that, it, doesn't match, it doesn't match their personalities. Whereas creative people, man, they dream archetypal dreams all the time. It's really interesting. And also, they die if they're, if they're not being creative. They wither on the vine. And I had one client, I really liked him. He was, he was a brilliant architect. And uh, his rational mind was his worst enemy because it just criticized everything. He was hyper-rational, criticized everything, and, and really in a dark way, and effectively, you know. Is if I could get him to not think and just create, he was a complete genius. He, he could, that's where all of the vitality in his life was. You know, that's where the sap rose up mm -hmm. inside the dead tree that was sort of embedded inside of him. And it's very common with creative people is that it's their lifeblood. And it really is from a biological perspective. This isn't some epiphenomena. It's, it's, it's built right into people and deeply. People are absolutely terrified of art. They're absolutely terrified. I of it, know. Which is why their favorite, Canadian's favorite decorating color is beige. It's like, really? It's like, don't paint your wall red because you'll never be able to resell your house. It's like everybody accepts that as a truth. It's like, you know, people can paint walls. It's a but, rather foolish piece, but people are terrified that they'll make a, an aesthetically displeasing choice and that everyone will laugh at them, and so they stick with beige. And they really are frightened of, uh, they really are frightened of art, and no wonder they should be. So, now, why should they be frightened of art? Because it speaks of the ultimate depths. If it's real art, it brings it into your it brings it into your house, man. You know, people come. I have got like 600 paintings in my house. Every square inch of the house is covered with paintings, and you know, it's quite a shock for people when they come in. Well, because some of them are of Lenin, so surprisingly enough. <laughs> I've <coughs> yeah, I've been yeah. in your house, Jordan, and a lot of them are of Lenin. Yes, yes. Well, I collected a bunch of Soviet realist art because I have interest in totalitarianism. So, but I have. Anyways, my walls are completely covered with art. And, and not as a nostalgia. It's not a nostalgia thing. No, it's not a nostalgia condition. thing, no. <laughs> it might be a prophetic thing, though. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, here's a, here's a good thing to do if you want to have a creative genius as, a, as a, an adult child. Die before you're there 10. That helps a lot. <laughs> so there's quite an extensive list. So if you're inclined to do that, suicide would really do it because... <laughs> Now explain, <laughs> explain that, please. Yeah, well, there, there's, a, there's a famous psychologist named Hans Isink, who, who was the most highly cited psychologist in the world for a long time, and for all I know, still may be. 
Um, he wrote a great book called Genius, which is a real study of, of creativity. It's the real thing. And so people just hate it because it's not full of, you know, platitudes that will make you feel good. You know, he says, to be truly creative, you have to have a near genius level IQ. And that sort of puts you in the one in 1,000 range. So that's kind of annoying to begin with. That might be me. I, I don't know. <laughs> And, and so, but, but he's also found that early, early traumatic experiences are good predictors of late, um, of late creativity. Now, now, we should also say that early traumatic experiences are also great predictors of catastrophic adult lives. So, but you can imagine, the, the thing that people don't understand about creativity, or one of them, is that um, there's no reason to be creative unless you have a problem to solve. And, you know, if, if someone dies on you young and you're forced to fend your way in the world and to deal with that kind of trauma. You have, to, you have to put yourself together in a creative manner, and it's no joke. And so early negative experiences allied with high intelligence and this kind of temperament that we were talking about is one of the things that fosters creative production. And, you know, parents are misinformed about this sort of thing because they think that if they, they just do laissez-faire things with their children, you know, you can do anything you want, they'll automatically be creative. It's like that's the stupidest thing you could possibly imagine because that isn't how creativity works. Creative, creativity emerges when you put serious constraints on things. And so a good example of that, like a, a symbolic example, is the example of the genie. You know, and the word genie is at the root of the word genius, so they're ni nicely tied together. And you th a genie is this tremendous godlike force encapsulated in this tiny little space. And in order for the genie to be able to grant wishes, it has to be both constrained extraordinarily tightly and be without constraint at the same time. It's the conjunction of those two things. And so in order to have someone be creative, you have to set them a difficult problem. You know, great literary figures, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, people like that, Shakespeare, man, they're solving tough, tough problems. And someone like Picasso, he invented an entirely new way to see. It's like, try that. I mean, a lot of these, these things are more biologically determined than people like to, like to admit. And so, I mean, what? If you're introverted, try turning yourself into an extrovert. See how well that works. It's good luck. Like, if you have a really <laughs> introverted child, you can make that child socially skilled and able to tolerate interactions with groups, but the probability that you'll make that child like it is so low, so low. Because introverts, for example, get exhausted by social contact. So those of you in the audience, you think, well, you go to a party, are you, do you have more energy afterwards or less? If the answer is, well, far less, I need to go sit in a dark room with an ice pack on my head, then, oh. you know, then you're more introverted. And it's very difficult to move that. You, you can, but it's very hard. And creativity is the same way. It's, it's, you, can, you can crush it. You can crush it. Crush creativity. Oh, sure, that's easy. And we do that all the time. And, and you're usually pretty happy about it, too. So, but Well, but give us an example of how to crush creativity so we don't Quit do it. Quit daydreaming. Oh my God, yes, yeah, I remember that's, that That's one. the same thing as saying, quit being creative. That's the same thing. Quit yeah. daydreaming. It's like, yeah, quit using your imagination. That you're, really you're bringing work. back bad memories now, Jordan. Yeah, I'm well, schools saying. do that all the time. Stop daydreaming and, and, and you know, pay attention to your work. It's like, well, what if my work is daydreaming? Well, yeah. then, <laughs> then we're going to punish you because you're going to be a good worker in a factory. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, those disappeared 100 years ago. I guess we haven't noticed yet. Oh, well, too bad for us. <laughs> and our children, right, and our future for that matter, because it's, it's unbelievably boneheaded. But, you know, once, it's, once a system gets established, it tends to persist. And so, well, that's how it is. But it's pretty sad. So, so where are the creative people in our society? There, we know that they're artists. So they're you, starving in garrets. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, are you creative? See my socks? Yeah, no. <laughs> that wasn't you, that was Van Gogh. <laughs> yeah, but I, like, I picked them out. Actually, my wife picked them out. <laughs> Actually, my wife picked them out. But I'll wear them. <laughs> yes, I'm creative. Um, I wanted to, to ask you, and I think we have a bit of time left, I wanted to get in a little bit deeper. People were upset about that painting because they think that art is decoration. Ah. They thought, well, you know, that's not decoration, or they'd think that I would, I'd be able to do that, which they wouldn't, by the way, because it's a lot harder than it sounds or mm -hmm. than it looks. But art is not decoration. That's absolutely foolish. Art is exploration. And artists train people to see. Like, you know, when, when, when the, most of you would, I presume, would regard um, Impressionist art as both self-evidently beautiful and also as um, 
relatively tr traditional, because of course you all now see, like Impressionists see, all of you that are even vaguely trained, even vaguely part of the 20th century, you can't help it because the Impressionist aesthetic saturated everything, saturated advertisements, saturated movies, saturated everything. You now see like an Impressionist. They taught you to see, but back when the Impressionists first showed up, there were riots when their art was hung because the, the idea of perceiving that way was so radical that it caused people to have emotional fits. You know, and so artists teach people to see, and I mean that literally, it's very hard to perceive the world. And so, and, and who was the artist that, that made all the squares with red and yellow and white? Oh, Pete Mondrian. Mondrian, he's a great example. I mean, if you go into, if you go downtown Toronto now, there are Mondrian buildings mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, and so he was playing very, very carefully and intensely with these, with these arrays of geometric shapes, you know, and that's not deck. Well, I like it, but it's not particularly decorative, and it's certainly not naturalistic or realistic. It's like, what's this crazy guy up to with all his squares? It's like, well, everything is built out of squares. So he's thinking, well, what are the interesting things we can do with squares? Mm -hmm. So they look, they, they shimmer and glow, and, and so that we get the geometric harmony proper, and it's just invaded architecture. You can see, you can see Mondrian mm -hmm. absolutely everywhere. And so these people, so here's a way of thinking about artistic and creative people from, an, from a biological perspective. So imagine that the world is basically uh, um, an explored territory inside an unexplored territory. Every world is like that. Everywhere you go is like that. There's things you know and there's things you don't know. And the conservative people like to be in the middle of the things that are known. It's, it's, and, and they can master that space and they're good at maintaining it. But the artists like to be right out on the edge. And that's the edge between chaos and order. And they like to expand the, dimension, the domain of order out into the chaos. And they do that first by transforming perception. And, but, and you can see very concrete examples of this if you think about what creative people do in cities. They always do it, the same thing. So they're, they're, at the, they're starving to death, and this is partly why, but they, look, they go in a city and they look at some ratty area that's sort of quasi-criminal and that's seen better days, and they go there and they think, you know, with a little work this could be cool. And so then they rush in there and they build some galleries and show some art and they civilize it a bit and then a coffee shop pops up and you know the next thing you know the, the, the yuppies move in because they're sort of creative but also kind of conservative so they're the next ones into the frontier and then the developers show up and they kick all the artists out. But that's, that's okay, because then the artists go off and rejuvenate some other area. And that's what artists do, is that they're transforming chaos into order all the time. That's where they live. They live on that edge. And so it's a very tough place to live, because you can fall into the chaos at any time. The dream is the thing that mediates between order and chaos. It starts to make chaos into order. So it's half chaos. That's why it's not comprehensible. And artists play exactly the same role in society. They're the visionaries that start to transform what we don't understand into at least what we can start to see. And they've always been that. They've always been at the vanguard. That's their biological niche. Think about, and this is one of the things that really bothers me about bothers me about the fact that conservative people have a hard time properly valuing art economically. It's so paradoxical because conservatives mm. are very concerned about right. economics. It's mm. like, okay, fine, then why don't you fund the damn artists? Because you look, Europe, Europe is so beautiful that it's just heartbreaking when you go there. I mean, there's, I've been to, to like medieval villages in, in Germany, for example, that just made me cry when I saw them. They're so damn beautiful. And, the beauty that the Europeans has, have produced is, is, is it's, it's infinitely valuable. People go from all over the world on pilgrimages to Europe just to look at beautiful things. It nourishes their soul. They're, they're, they're priceless. They're, Paris is priceless. Rome is priceless. And it's all beauty that drives it. It's phenomenally valuable. And Canada is just ugly as sin, man. <laughs> really. Okay. So then I came across this story by Robert Sapolsky, I think it was Robert Sapolsky, and he was talking about zebras. And so I'll take two minutes and tell you the zebra story, because if you understand this story, you understand absolutely everything about human beings, and so it's worth two minutes. So, so you know, zebras hypothetically are camouflaged, right? That's what everyone says, but come on, really? Lions are camouflaged, they're the same color as the grass. Zebras are black and white, you can see one of those things like a, a mile away. But there isn't a zebra. There's a herd of zebras. And so the zebra's actually camouflaged against the herd. Now that's something to think about. So 
the stripes of zebras are the zebra's jargon. That's a good way of thinking about Ooh. it. Yeah, no kidding, no kidding. <laughs> So anyway, so biologists go out and study zebras, and zebra biologists, and they're gonna, they gotta watch a zebra to figure out what it's up to. And so they watch a zebra, and then they make a note, and then they look up and they think, oh my God, like which collection of black and white stripes was that zebra? Because the stripes don't outline the zebra, and they camouflage the zebra perfectly against the herd. So if you look away from the zebra down and back up, you don't know what you're looking at. So the biologists think, oh, Kurt, we better, we better solve this problem. So they drive up to the herd with a jeep and a bucket of red paint and a stick with a rag on the end of it and they, they paint one of the zebra's haunches with a red spot or they clip its ear like you do with cattle. Then you can keep track of the zebra. Guess what happens to the zebra? The lions eat it. Oh. Right. Oh is right. Bloody right. Oh. Yeah. The lions cannot hunt a single zebra down unless they can identify it because they organize their hunt. They have to organize their hunt around and identify. You can't hunt four zebras. You or, can only hunt right. one at you a can't, time. You can't hunt a blur of zebras. No. And so the reason they go after the little ones or the ones that limp isn't because you know they're part of kind nature and just culling the weak. That they like a nice, healthy, delicious, juicy zebra as much as the next person. You know. So, so but they they have to be able to identify. So the thing is, is you make yourself colorful. You stand out. The lions will kill you. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. Well, Canadians, we don't like to stand out. We like everybody to do okay. But we don't like it very much when people stand out. And so, and I mean, I'm not being entirely critical of that. I really do understand it. I really do understand it. Because there's lions out there, you guys. There are. There, that's right. There, and there, there definitely are. And if you stick your neck out, then the lions will come. Or the sword, because that's a common saying, right? Mm -hmm. The head that sticks up above the rest is the first to be cut, out, cut off by the sword. Mm -hmm. Many, many cultures have a saying like that. The poppy that grows higher right. than the rest is the, the first. The tall poppy syndrome. Exactly, exactly. And so, and it's exactly right. It's, it's biologically correct.